The first question that I generally am asking is, who was Laura Pearls to you? What was your experience of her? Well, um, I met her um, in, I think, fall 1977, um, when I ca came to Berkeley, visiting there, and also checking out um, the Gestalt Institute San Francisco and uh, the um, uh, um, California Graduate School for Marital and Family Therapy, because I intended to come after my diploma, which is like a master's in Germany. Uh, in nowadays, we have also master's, but in my days, it was called a diploma. Um, when I finished that, I intended after some time working to go to America, which was always my dream. And it was California and it was Gestalt therapy. <laughs> I had heard uh, it, at the end of my studies as a very new thing about Gestalt therapy and had experienced a variety of therapies before. So I wanted to do Gestalt therapy. And so I came to that visit to America and um, my later to be husband, Jerry, uh, he often hosted her when she came to San Francisco. And uh, he also made a party for the Institute for her. So on one of those parties, I met her and um, we connected very quickly because we came from the same part of Germany and she spoke my dialect and she was very happy to speak uh, with me in her dialect. So um, she said she would uh, come to Germany and or intend to come more often. Um, and so we decided to connect. Um, and I had also a friend uh, in Germany who worked in the University of Frankfurt. And she visited me then the year later when I was in America, um, in Berkeley and San Francisco. And so she came again to such a party and decided to invite her later on to, um, to organize something in the university that she would be honored as uh, it was around the time she had her 50 years anniversary of her doctorate, which she received from the University of Frankfurt originally. And so she got a golden, um, um, a golden um, doctoral uh, uh, paper. Uh, and she also did lectures there. And at the time she stayed with us, but that's when I knew her already quite well. Um, but I just wanted to mention this other woman and somehow uh, she was for me so much liberating in many ways. Starting out with this modest little person, <laughs> she was, I mean, she could also be different. She was very dignified. She always walked pretty upright. Um, she was not too shy to perform with piano playing in any occasion she had, but she was as a person quite modest. And I was always so nervous when I stood in front of a group and I had some in my life, some earlier shaming experiences in childhood and in school with public speaking. So I asked her once, how does she do that? And she said, I'm nervous every single time, but then I just say so and it vanishes. <laughs> Paradoxical theory of change. And that impressed me so much that she in the age of at the time she was in her end 70s. No, we yeah, are mid 70s. And I thought, wow, if Laura can do that um, and is still nervous so long later, but lives with that uh, nervousness and anxiety, then maybe I can live with it too. Because I was always fighting that and looked for a trick to overcome it. And she said, uh, just acknowledge it and maybe state it and see what happens. And so I did and made a big, big change in my life. So 
um, I adored her. And we had a very nice relationship sometimes when we arranged a new workshop. She would call me from New York, or I called her, and she would always say, um, my love, which is unusual for her. She was actually raised a bit more Prussian, and that meant to be very minimalistic in your expression of affection. I mean, you were friendly, you were warm, but you were, before a German says, I love you, they bite their tongue off. <laughs> now she was she yeah that's true you say i like you but love oh that's really reserved for very special moments now maybe laura could do that slipping into her american self where i love you is an easy thing to say however her her uh, daughter renate was standing next to her and was saying to her well, you never said that to me. Then she turned to her and said, well, consider it be said. So that was a bit, I, I felt a bit sorry for, for Renate <laughs> with this remark, even though she was quite fond of uh, Renate in many ways, but uh, at home, she was more German with her. Now, the funny thing is that the detour of being American, and I meet her as an American, but with Sch Sch Schwäbisch background, <laughs> she could say that to me. Maybe because her she stayed connected to her friend from high school, or actually so even from primary school, all her life. And if you ever saw that video um, uh, living at the Boundary, which was made by um, uh, a person who is in my supervision group. Um, there is also a scene where she visits in full time her old, old friend, and she did that every year from primary school. And the two old ladies were happy and their relationship survived the Hitler time. Because this woman, her best friend, was not Jewish. But despite all the terrible things happening uh, to her family, she was not channelizing. She could separate her true uh, loyalty to her uh, childhood friend from these terrible experiences and had joy returning to her home city. That, that is remarkable. Yeah, That's Fritz that. never managed that. Mm -hmm. But she did, and so so actually, she was extremely curious to meet German Gestalt therapists. So she had always she always called it called it. I have my German girls. I go to. So she came to me. She and, and to Jerry, of course, too. But I mean, she connected very much with the girls. Then she she had um, this friend of mine in Frankfurt and another woman in Frankfurt uh, who she knew not so well, but a little bit. And then she went to uh, Pforzheim, her, her place where she uh, used to grow up. And, uh, and then she went to Nancy in Vienna. And that was her tour every year. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. I, I've heard so many people speak about Laura and Germany in different ways. So that's, mm -hmm. That's interesting what you've just said. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering a little bit about her work and how you saw that, how you experienced it and how Laura's way of working has stayed with you. Yeah, actually, again, that influenced me also a great deal. Uh, as a different people, influenced me and uh, Cindy is one of the ones and I will speak to that in a, in a, on another occasion. Uh, but one of the things um, which I got from Laura was per even more permission to be who I am. Um, since she uh, was not trying to be anybody different, she was very 
um, much uh, loyal to the way she was. Uh, no matter how Fritz was, she had a certain way she was and she stuck to it. Um, and she would say, I think that was very clarifying because in Germany when she came, and I think we were very lucky that she did come for so many years, it was a period of about 10 years. She would appear every year for three months and as of some of it was her vacation time, but some of it was doing workshops. Um, she clarified a lot of the misconceptions of Gestalt therapy because what basically was known at the time was Fritz's style and, and represented by a character whose name I'm not <laughs> naming now, uh, who didn't even know him so well, but used his name as an institute name and um, criticized him heavily, but also at the same time did workshops there where a lot of his style was shown. And even an exaggeration of that style, um, being kind of in a, I would say in a German way, with pointed fingers. You're not responsible, take responsibility, uh, do this, do that. Um, that was not Gestalt. Laura would never say that. She would say, um, why don't you allow yourself to, to try that out? Or, um, well, come on here to me or something like that. But it was always inviting. And she would, she, she was not very much into techniques. She almost, as every once in a blue moon, she would use the, the empty chair, but very frequently she just talked to you and she also had not a rigid rule. We first do the check-in and then we look who wants to work. She would start, she comes in a group and she would say, who wants what? <laughs> and then as, or sometimes she would start with a check-in, but in the check-in did little works which made some people kind of a little impatient because they had a certain rule. We first finish the circle, then we establish who wants to work. That didn't bother her. Whatever she saw in a check-in, she would pick up and make some remarks and let people try out something like this voice, this standing or whatever. Sometimes she would say to somebody, um, could you sing what you just said? Or could you dance what you just said? And that way she always looked for a more full ex expression of what person came with. Um, so it was, it gave me a lot of permission in many ways to, to see how this would unfold. She totally trusted the process. And um, in the beginning, people were a bit like, well, she doesn't quite follow the rules, but whose rules? <laughs> These were her rules. And she would also say, there are so many, um, as a gestalt therapy, first of all, is not a technique. It is more of a style. And in gestalt therapy, there are so many styles as there are gestalt therapists meaning that everything a person has learned and become and every, all the richness we have learned and is in our background uh, becomes our resource to draw from in the present moment with a client. So that was a great discovery. Very, very encouraging. And there were many other things she um, she was uh, correcting, in a way, for misconceptions. Especially, I, I don't want to really blame Fritz, but it's more his followers, which have, uh, um, um, how can you say, rigid, rigidified his style, and thought if they imitate him, they would be 
doing the right thing. But he never demanded that. So yeah. I'm I'm wondering if you remember any particular pieces of work with Laura, any sessions from the groups that you were in or that you witnessed. Yeah. Um, you know, um, she was responsible for the chapter, the dummy complex in uh, ego, hunger, and aggression. There was actually something she always looked for in a group, uh, for learned um, um, helplessness. And when, when she discovered that someplace, she would always work on making that more pregnant. Um, she would have people notice what the advantage and disadvantage of this behavior was or even just first notice what they are doing. Or she would make them aware of what the body posture was. And often it was <laughs> that, and often a kind of, um, you know, this uh, sucking hold on, what you call the hold, hold on bite. And then she would say, okay, and now um, watch what happens if you go a little back and erect yourself, become comfortable and watch the other. What is happening in you if you take a different position? Sometimes she had them close their eyes and feel it first and then uh, look at the world again. And people frequently noticed that they are afraid that the other one might disappear or that they may, might, um, that they might yeah, lose their friendship or whatever. So she could get right away to the origin of this and how that manifested in the body. And, and she would immediately pick that out. And, and <laughs> very often that made people cry and um, they realized that, but they never noticed that before. And, and just from a little thing like that, she could immediately come to the core. And this whole thing about posture and expression, the way you use your voice to either suck in the environment or you carry your message out. That was something she could see half of your biography. <laughs> And she used this all the time. She even sometimes in her old age would get up and demonstrate what she saw. She, she would uh, in, either get into the posture of the other person said, look, this is how I experienced you. What do you see when you see me? And stuff like that. And then she would see, say, or for example, I use the story with um, Yaro, which he, uh, and, and then of course, he, maybe he mentioned it himself, I don't know, in his interview. But she would say something, he was supposed to tell his story with movement, and he did, he showed different movements and how he grew up. Tell me how you grew up, she said. And, and he showed that this movement, and then she says, you missed the stage. You remember that? Yeah. So stuff like that. I mean, very, very perceptive. And she always picked something like that up. And I think who works nowadays very much um, like that is, um, nah, now I'm blocking the name, the woman from New York. Um, Ruella. Ruella. Frank. Uh, Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Frank, yeah. um, I have seen her doing that in some of the uh, AHET conferences and I thought, yeah, I can see her connection to Laura. Yeah. Yeah, she's very connected. And yes, Yarrow did tell that particular story as well, so. Or I give another, one other way of working. She worked with Cherry, my husband. Um, we, have, we did a check-in again in one of the workshops. There was a workshop just 
done for trainers. So we, uh, we were just uh, among, let's say, all experienced therapists. And Jerry just responded about the sadness um, he felt when our dog Shorty died. That was, was our baby, so to speak. We had him 20 years. And Laura, by the way, knew him very, very well. Every time she came, I said, basically, Shorty would accompany her in any group we had. So um, uh, usually, uh, uh, Shorty was sitting next to Laura. And look, I here is a picture. And she had her hand on it while she spoke to the group. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, she, uh, she, she, of course, she was sad too. And then she said to Cherry, um, but you're not letting go. You're still grieving. This was half a year later or so. Actually, he died in, December, uh, in January and the workshop was in summer. So she said, how old are you? And at the time he said, I think, I don't know anymore how old it was, 52. So she said, you are not um, facing your second half of life. And of course that was to the core. So in a way, his hanging on to the grief of Shorty and a former time was not facing the time without surety and that death is part of life. And also his end will come at some point. And it and of course that is a bit in I mean, one could say that's an interpretation which Gestalt therapists shouldn't do, but she didn't say it really just like he has had to swallow it. I mean the way he responded is it, it was of course the same. So, um, yeah, that was one of the things she did. And then she asked him to sit next to her. And he sat next to her for the rest of the session and cried. And she put her hand on his leg and, and then he was finished crying at the end of the session and it was good. That was one of the ways she worked as a minimalistic and it was all picked up in a in a check-in uh, from a group you know and while he was sitting there next to her and crying as a, he didn't cry loud he was just doing his thing she continued with the group yeah and so how would you say that laura and her presence and her work have affected you? Well, some of it I said, but another thing which I also want to point out is another thing which I now repeat many times when I teach. Um, she had a different way of dealing with resistance than any other digital service I knew. Even Fritz, who was uh, developing together with also Paul Goodman, all these four main resistances or, or describing them. He didn't have this notion of, and that now comes the notion she always said, every resistance is an assistance of something, which I found wonderful. How can you, so the resistance is not something to be abolished, you look of the assisting part of that behavior. And it becomes part of your resources. So you add to it, when, but you don't uh, pull it away or break through or have a catharsis and then it should be behind you. No, it's still important. Just become aware of it, what it served you for, and it might still serve you another time. So. It's great, and she talked about the resistance in the Second World War, and the war would have been so much longer, lasted so much longer if there had not been resistance movements. 
especially in France, the resistance. So this notion of resistance was for me fantastic because in my life, um, <laughs> I, had a, I had a role in my family as even my name was chosen that way. Wiltrud means willpower. And my mother said the first moment I came to this world, I was um, um, stubbornly crying. <laughs> and so, um, in a way, my resistance or will was not seen as something, a creative adaptation, but rather something very disturbance. And here comes liberation, Laura. <laughs> And she would also say for kids um, that um, resistance, like even oral resistance, she spoke about that too in her article, is a means of uh, handling the environment. Um, the moment, it's one of the first individuation parts when you become resistant or when you look for something to like, for example, when you develop teeth, your teeth are not there to annoy mommy. <laughs> your teeth are there to um, have some means to handle the environment. And you need definitely also stronger food than just interjecting milk. So that it doesn't mean when you have only two or three teas that you completely stop uh, drinking milk, but you learn, need to learn to differentiate between the breast where you get fluid food and something you can chew and have to make the non-me into me by chewing. So reframing a, a certain amount of aggression as necessary and a means to handle the environment was for me fantastic. And until today, that is still something in, um, I, I often visit um, the analysts because we have the um, Freud Institute here in Frankfurt and I go frequently to their lectures and sometimes his discussions. I mean, they have changed a lot. They are not anymore so rigid as it used to be in the times of Fritz and Laura. But this whole concept of resistance being something positive or an assistance for something is still news to them. So that is one of the main ways she has given me a kind of support for, um, for not being ashamed of my sometimes question things. Um, I often, I always had the, uh, I don't know, that was always my role to ask uncomfortable questions or to go to the core of things. And I was said, can you not just leave it? I mean, you, you keep doing that long enough, you become a, prof a professional therapist, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's her influence. Hmm. So I, I mean, I, I literally ask people, as well do you have a favorite Laura story <laughs> is there another any other stories that come to mind that I mean in session out of session that you would like to share maybe two <laughs> one is more her her sense of herself we live in Frankfurt and I'm right now speaking from that place in an apartment an old building without an elevator and we have 85 steps to go up to. It's the top floor. And as I said, she lived mainly with us when she came, but there came a time it was a bit too hard for her. Um, but the year she was the last time there, she still would tell in groups, well, Willie and Cherry live, have a very nice apartment. It's a bit far up for older people. But for me, I, I still manage and yeah. So she was at the time, I think 79 or, or even 80. And she said, oh, for older people, it might be a problem, not for me. 
that's how she saw herself. She was very long, extremely useful and, and risky. I mean, in, she came to Germany even in the year she died. She was about to become 85 that year, imagine. And she was still coming to do a workshop that year. It turned out she, she had some trouble during this whole year leading up to the year of 85, where she was already in the States a bit sick. And so she could not do her workshops that year. In fact, she needed to go in a kind of uh, old age home in, um, in um, only temporary in Pforzheim until a place which friends of mine who wanted to take her in their own home until their home would be finished. And then she never made it that far anymore. She died there. I so she died actually then in a hospital, but until very short before. I visited her still there. So that's, that's one story. The other story is her dignity. Um, in that old age home, like very often, they had no notion who she was. So they made automatically when she came in, they would say, oh, Oma Pearls, here is your room. And um, whenever they did something, they, for example, she, 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 she didn't like the German food there. I mean, she would always get a cold sausage at night and a piece of bread. That was all that was delivered. And she wanted what's called a grease pie. <laughs> it's a kind of, um, how do you call it? Some cereal type, cooked cereal. And they said, no, our kitchen is closed. Oh, my pearls. You have to wait until tomorrow. Then she elevated herself in her bed and said, for you, I'm still Dr. Pearls. And I was in the room then. And I said, yeah, and I support that. I want, it, I want you for the remaining time to call her that way. She's not an old Oma. She is who she is. She is still Frau Dr. Pearls. So they made a note of that, and uh, everybody then kept calling her that. She did it not because she was uh, snobby, but the degradation into a dummy Oma, this learned helplessness, could not be something she could surrender to. She was still self-determined. And we also reached, for, uh, as my friend and I would go to the uh, leadership of that old age home. So we, we, we reached the possibility that she could get her the cooked cereal in the night. <laughs> Yes, when I was listening to you, I, I was imagining she did not have cold sausage for dinner. <laughs> no, no, that was, I mean, she, she it was anyway kind of health conscious, not in the extent we are all to nowadays, but in, for those days, she was very clear that she wanted basically vegetables, basically other things than cooked meat. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, because I'm asking people about things that happens sometimes 10 or 15 years before I was born. And the clarity and the detail of the experiences of Laura that have stayed with people are extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, they're really, really extraordinary. Yeah. So I... I and now I have one more little story. The Please. other side, the other side, I mean, this was one where she was asserting herself, dig, being dignified, and the other one was where she felt so young. But she sometimes when she came to visit, I, I every year around that time, I was up to here in having to do taxes, both for, our, for myself and for the Institute. And I, I was often overwhelmed with taking good care of her. <laughs> And she had, she came a bit early and she had nothing else to do. So sometimes she would just sit on our sofa and listen to Edith Piaf and dance through the room. And then when it came to around five o'clock, she started to get hungry and she said, what, 
what do you think we could do for dinner? And I said, I can take you out for dinner um, or we can cook something or I can cook something for you. And she said, I thought you have enough to do. Why don't I make you an omelet? And then she, as the visitor, made me an omelet. So she is not at all that snob she was often perceived. Uh, she was very an easy guest. I found her always a very easy guest. That says a lot about a person. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I'm just my, I guess I, I'm looking forward to speaking with you more about your own story later. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering how you're feeling now, having brought Laura back in for a little bit. What, what right feeling now? or, yeah, what feeling or sensation are you left with? Well, a smile comes in my face. Um, and a big, big gratefulness. I feel very, very blessed that she could, I, that she accompanied my life for quite some time. It was actually her last 10 years. Um, and, and in a way, I had quite some gestalt training before with different people, and that supplemented it so nicely and, and in a way polished it into this more permission giving, being more myself. And I, I feel just so grateful for having known her. And she felt always like, a, she was a teacher, but she always felt my, like a friend and she would always call us friends. Well, thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add right now? Or is this okay? Well, I would also, oh, this one more thing. Um, you know, this first book plus the film, this is now in German, Living at the Boundary. Um, it, it would be the English version and the English version of the film. Um, was also something important she did was encourage one to always go to what's possible. Never stop before the boundary. You know, people often say, ah, it's good, I, I let go. And she said, no, you will not be satisfied. Go to the boundary. And then it's easy to let go when, when there is no way further. And that again gave support for my stubbornness I always had because I did it for a reason. So there's so many things of behaviors I had, which were labeled as undesirable, which he was just encouraging as the thing to do, and which had to do with, with maybe being a bit too strong in my individuation. <laughs> um, uh, not that I was always very proud with that. I felt sometimes ashamed about it. Um, but she would give, she would say, yeah, go for it, uh, or go to the boundary. And that's another big thing. And people, I think, should all read that book, simply because it's full of adding to Fritz's work and correcting misconceptions of Gestalt therapy, and also presenting her own um, way of working. For example, that every um, a contact uh, in every newness, in every contact with newness requires support, either uh, environmental support, especially when you're small, and then slowly transitioning more into self-support. So that was, that nobody else said that besides Laura. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pleasure.